Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by Real Good Foods. Real food you feel good about eating. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome to a bonus episode of the show. Yeah, the last week of every month this year, we have been doing these extras where we take uh, part of the interview in the regularly scheduled Tuesday released episode, but then we take a deep dive into the topic. And this week, I am so happy to bring you this panel. I was able to moderate a stellar panel of women with type 1, and we talked about everything from periods, to menopause, to talking to your doctors more frankly, to body image. You know, what's it like to wear uh, diabetes technology on your body when we're all going through these uh, appearance issues with or without diabetes? The panel was taped a couple of months ago already now uh, at the Touched by Type 1 conference that is put on by the folks behind Dancing with Diabetes, and that is Elizabeth Forrest. She is the founder of both groups. She lives with Type 1, and she is on the panel. You will hear from her. You will also hear from lawyer Risa Katz. She has Type 1, as does her daughter. And Nicole Johnson, who is with JDRF now and is Miss America. She was crowned in 1999. Three really strong women, each with their own unique story, each with incredible advice for women with Type 1, for moms of daughters with Type 1. And I was just happy to be in the same room with them and ask them a few questions. A couple of quick notes. We did get these questions from the Facebook group. If you're not in that, it is Diabetes Connections, the group. And when I have a a topic like this, you know, something that I'm not personally familiar with, I do have a daughter, but she doesn't have type one. And women's issues with type one is not really something that we've talked a lot about in my household. Um, When I have situations like that, I always put it to the Facebook group. So I took a lot of your questions and I was able to bring those to the panel. I also need to let you know that this took place right around the same time that Steel Magnolias was re-released in theaters. So we, we talk about that right at the beginning. And Steel Magnolias, if you're not familiar, is a movie that features a plot line about type 1 diabetes. The story in the movie is real. It's based on a true story, but it's from a long time ago. Um, the movie's a bit out of date. And it is, it's frankly kind of frightening. We've actually done episodes on the movie itself. And we don't go into too much detail here, but I do want to let you know that's why we start off with that question. If you've already listened to the first part of the panel, which aired in the episode immediately preceding this one, it's easy to skip ahead in this one because um, we stopped basically at 28 minutes in. So if you go 28 minutes into the interview, you'll pick up where the excerpt from the last episode left off. But you can certainly listen to the whole thing. A lot of valuable information here. And I'll link up more in the show notes that I do for every episode. So here's the panel. And I jump right in with some in-depth introductions for the women. Risa Katz is immediately to my right. She was diagnosed with type 1 three months before her wedding, four months before moving from New York to Florida and beginning law school. At law school, she focused on discrimination in the workplace and in schools under federal laws, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, and her practice consisted of helping those who experience discrimination. So Risa has four children in age 12 to 22, and in 2008, her youngest and her only daughter was diagnosed with type 1 at 18 months of age, and she is now 12. And it was at that time that Risa decided to put her career on hold and dedicate her time to caring for her daughter and making sure she never felt excluded or alone. And Risa is on the board for Dancing for Diabetes and has that perspective of having type 1 as a woman and being a mom. So thank you so much for being here. We have a pinch hitter in the middle here. I don't know if anybody knows this strange woman, stranger to all of us. And if you don't know, that is a joke, I will explain. (laughs) Elizabeth Forrest, of course, is the reason why this conference is here and why Dancing for Diabetes is here. Diagnosed at age 10, she founded Dancing for Diabetes in middle school. And I think probably the time, having not known you then and not knowing much about the event, it seemed like one of the sweet things a lot of our kids have done. Lemonade stand... 
dance recital. But it turned into this incredible event, I mean, organized by a middle schooler and now an annual event that is just a powerhouse. And Touched by Type 1 started three years ago. There's a lot of accolades that Elizabeth has gathered, but recently, the one that stood out to me, 2018 on the Women of the Year list for Orlando Magazine. So congratulations and thanks for doing what you do. And on my far right is Nicole Johnson, who has a doctorate in public health, is the national director of mission at JDRF, and she's been on the JDRF International Board of Directors, been a volunteer there for more than 25 years. Again, the list goes on and on and on. She is an author, a journalist, and a broadcaster, a co-founder of the Diabetes Empowerment Foundation, as well as its subsidiary, Students with Diabetes, the founder of Diabetes Partners and Diabetes Moms. You may also know she did this little thing. She's Miss America, 1999. So thank you so much for making time. And she has a daughter, too. We were just talking. Your daughter is 13 years old and does not have type 1 diabetes. So really a wonderful panel with a lot of experience. I'm going to ask a question and stop talking now. <laughs> but my first question is, we'll go down the line. You may know and be familiar with the movie Steel Magnolias. Steel Magnolias is sometimes people's first point of contact with type 1 diabetes. They have re-released the movie after 30 years. It has its 30-year anniversary release this weekend. So I thought we'd just start real quickly by going down the line. Reese, I'll start with you. Steel Magnolias, love it or hate it, yay or nay? Actually, I've never seen it. (laughs) Um, Once I hadn't seen it before I was diagnosed. And then once I was diagnosed with type 1, my mother, who had already seen it, told me, don't ever watch this movie. And since then, I've kind of learned a little of what it's about. And I have to say, I really don't want to watch it because I want to keep a very positive outlook. And I've been through three pregnancies successfully, and I want to look at it that way rather than focus on the negative aspects. Well, as I am 30, I was not around when the movie (laughs) was was released, (laughs) and I actually only heard about it a few years ago at one of these diabetes events, and I heard of the movie, but I never knew there was a connection with type 1 diabetes, and I heard someone speaking about the movie And, of course, in the connection to type 1 diabetes, and I I just haven't gotten around to seeing it. So, I don't know. I guess I'm in the middle. Oh, my gosh. Neutral. I'm the only one that's seen it on the panel. Phew. All right. I've probably seen it like 10 times. (laughs) You never know. I mean, it's on on the weekends on cable, right? You know what? I'm going to be a very different opinion than you would expect. I'm going to say love it. And here's why. We don't have enough movies or scripts or plays coming out of Hollywood that have a type 1 element, and they get it wrong a lot, but they get parts of it right, and it gets us talking, and that has incredible value. Um, I met the young man that was the son of the woman that the movie was inspired by uh, many years ago. He's not young anymore. Um, I met him many years ago, and he was incredibly proud that his mother's story um, was portrayed in, in the way that it was. And I found that very inspiring. That's great. And I, I love it too because I saw it, well, I'm a little older than you, I saw it a long time ago before I had children. And I loved it. I think it's a great movie. But, it, you know, it is a true story, but it is of its time. So to your point, I wish we had more current movies that dealt with type 1 in some kind of realistic way. But thank you, ladies. Okay. So I have a list of questions. I For Diabetes Connections, my podcast, I have a Facebook group. And I told them we were going to be having this panel, and they inundated me with questions about women's health and type 1 diabetes. And I know that you're prepared for some frank talk, right? That's why we're here. So I think we're going to just go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and go ahead and start talking about periods and that kind of thing, because that was the thing that really came up a lot. And I think it's well known, maybe it's not, that your cycle can affect your blood sugars. So the question came up, and I'm just going to go down the line, and then we'll pick different orders, though, after this one. Um, how do you figure that out? Do you chart it? Do you, do you track it? How can you best manage knowing that you're going to have blood sugar swings all through your cycle? Th- that's a great question, and I can speak to it as of in two different perspectives, for myself and then for my daughter, who's just going through puberty right now. Um, with myself, it was an expectation of every month, two weeks of good blood sugars and two weeks of just absolutely crazy blood sugars. And I would try to chart it every month to predict, and I would actually have a higher basal rate on my insulin pump 
turn that on about two or three days before I was expecting to get it to just um, stay ahead of it. And that would work some months, and some months it wouldn't work. But for the most part, it really helped me to stay as in control as possible. Now, with my daughter, go, she's 12 years old. She's had her period for a little over a year now. We haven't reached that point yet. Her blood sugars are just incredibly all over the place. And I've been a little frustrated and having to talk to her about the importance of charting it because we really need to figure out what that pattern is so I know when to increase her basal rates. And we're in just the learning curve now. Because, you know, it's an embarrassing thing for a 12-year-old. They just, she doesn't want to talk about her period. <laughs> she you know, doesn't even want to think about it. So, but, but we're working on it, and I think at some point we'll get there, and um, it's always going to be a struggle. You know, I, there's no quick, easy answer to it, but, you know, as long as you continue working at it, I think you can be successful in navigating it. So does anyone still use a logbook to keep track of blood sugars? I don't. But when I was a teenager, my mom was still very big on, on us using the logbook to track everything. For me, I never noticed a difference when I was on my period, if my blood sugars would be a little bit higher during that period of time. I have always been have a less of an appetite during that period though. And so then I would eat less, take less insulin. So I noticed that pattern, but I've never found that it rises like I hear a lot of others go through. But at the same time, we were tracking it so precisely with a logbook and still being a, a young girl doing that. Um, but to this day, I don't, I don't see it that often. Every now and then you see it, but you know, that's diabetes. I haven't, I haven't seen anything other than that. Okay. So. Moms, who has a daughter in the room with type one? A couple. And then who are type one adult women? Okay. Okay. Birth control pills are probably a part of your reality. And if not yet, they will be soon, I would hope, because preconception management is very important. So with period, we have discussion of making sure that we're not getting pregnant. So the birth control pill packs that I have used for 30 years, when I get to the colored pills that uh, denote my week of my period, I know my blood sugars are going to drop. And that's how I know. So that's played a really big role in my 26 years with type 1, is that I know when I get to that week of brown colored pills to expect to have low blood sugars on the first two days of my period. And that's about all the tracking I ever did on this because it made it easy. And we've got to normalize as much as possible. I would give you a word of guidance for your young women or for those of you who have type 1 um, to not overburden yourself with things that you don't have to. If you can figure out a way to combine tasks, do that because it lessens the emotional burden and trauma that you experience. And let me just ask you a follow-up if I could, Nicole, because that is a conversation I think a lot of women with type 1 are having. Um, I'm not even sure how to ask this question, so I'll just kind of blurt it out. With birth control, is that something that your endocrinologist needs to be involved in in terms of what kind or what brand or anything like that? Is it? Are you women with type 1 just go ask your OBGYN for whatever your insurance covers? Is that an endo level or an OBGYN? I've never gone through my endo for birth control pills. <laughs> Silly, but I don't know. <laughs> but but here's here's like a caveat that I'll add to it. So the OBGYN is the one that really figures that out. And there are varying levels of estrogen and hormones. Um, <laughs> uh, in Let me know if you need a juice pills. box. And um, and so you have to figure that out with your OB. I had to figure out that I was allergic to generic forms of birth control pills. And that would break me out into hives and make my blood sugars go to 500. And so that was a no-go for us. But that was the discussion between me and the OB. The one word of caution with the OBGYN, they are used to diabetes during pregnancy. And so their mindset is that A1C should be 5%. And they're not really attuned to the normal mindset of what your A1C is when you're not in a pregnancy state. So guard your heart or the woman that you love's heart a little bit about that. Because I've had a couple of instances where I had to do a fair amount of educating with the OB to say, you know, my endocrinologist is going to manage my diabetes, not you. And here we're going to deal with reproductive health. And 
draw the barriers. Yeah. Risa, let me ask you a little bit about that with your daughter. I know you're probably not at that particular level, but that's a hard separation all around to be able to, I mean, we're educating as parents of kids with type one when you go to the dentist or the eye doctor half the time, I can't imagine. On, do you have that experience for yourself when you were getting pregnant with your OB? Yes, I did. Uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because when I, I've gone through three pregnancies and the pregnancy, especially with my daughter, I was 37 years old and I was dealing with a new high risk doctor. And every time I would come in, because I had multiple ultrasounds because of the high risk, he would talk to me about how my A1C level is too high. And I think I was at like a 6.3, something like that, for a pregnancy with twins, which my endocrinologist was thrilled about. But every time I would come in, I almost dreaded the appointment. I'm like, yes, I wanted to see the ultrasound of the baby, but I didn't want another lecture. And I would try to explain to him, My endocrinologist is handling this. I've been going to her for the past 20 years. She has been with me through my other pregnancies. We got it handled. But it it never really got through to him. So it was just a decision, you know, on my part to just, I knew I was being taken care of, just get through the appointment, listen to him, enjoy the ultrasounds, know that she was healthy and developing, and just move on from there. But I agree, you do have to have that discussion and you will encounter that from the doctors. And I think it's a lot also because they deal with a lot of type 2s. And with type 2 diabetes, it's just a completely different ballgame. And you can get your A1Cs down a lot lower, a lot easier. But when you're type 1, as we all know, it's, it's a huge struggle, and especially with all the hormones and everything. So I would say, don't stress it about, you know, your OB or your specialist. Follow your endocrinologist advice, because they're the ones that know you. They're the ones that really understand it. Just because of this topic, we should jump to A1C recommendations during pregnancy, just because I don't want anybody to have a misperception, because you've just heard some numbers thrown out there. So the American Medical Association and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and all of the diabetes um, medical associations, the recommendation is that your A1C is below 7 All right, so that's when you get pregnant. While you're pregnant, baby helps you a little bit. That doesn't mean baby's taking your insulin or taking things from mom, but because you're growing a human, (laughs) you're doing some extra work. And so your A1C drops a lot, and it's not as horribly hard as it sounds like it is. And so throughout my pregnancy, I was at about a 6% A1C. Baby helped me a lot. Now I worked a lot, really, uh, (laughs) did a lot of hard work too. And I know you did too, but I wanted to make sure that we laid that out there. If you're healthcare professionals, you should engage with them, or the women that you love should engage with them prior to becoming pregnant. This needs to be an ongoing conversation from now until pregnancy time, because we need to keep opening the door, understanding why we need to practice safe sex if we're engaging in sexual activity, and why planning a pregnancy is incredibly important. We know adverse consequences happen during pregnancy if your A1C is higher. And the literature shows that A1Cs above 8% can lead to some devastating consequences. It doesn't always, but that's where the literature feels comfortable showing it. So the recommendation is below 7. And some organizations will go even further down into the 6 range. Thank you. That's a great clarification. Elizabeth, let me ask you, because we've heard from two women who are, I would say, pretty self-confident, well-educated women who felt a little annoyed by their healthcare providers. You're uh, not someone to be pushed around. You know, have you encountered that? And what is your advice? I mean, you you know, it's it's difficult because you have to choose that. Is this the day that I fight this? Is this the day that I don't? I mean, how important is it? Have you encountered that? And what do you do? Sure. I think that everyone has has a fight at some point and some more than others and some days harder than others. But I know that with my endocrinologist in particular, I have a really good relationship. I've been seeing him for many years at this point. And early on, we had a very open conversation where he asked me, why are your blood sugars so high? And I said, 
I have type 1 diabetes. What can you do for me? And so we, that's how, it, that's how it opened, really, in the very beginning. And we've been very honest with each other, open. He's very hands-on. And, and so it works well. But to go back to OB, when I went to her, I went on birth control much later uh, in my early, mid-20s. And I went to her asking, you know, I have type 1 diabetes. What should I learn about? What, what do I need to do? And she deferred me to my endo. And he said, go for it. Pick whichever you want. So I think it's just communicating with your doctors. Um, and sometimes you have to have the conversation of, I have type 1 diabetes, remember, when you're seeing the non-endos and, and that. But there's always fights to have, unfortunately. But I think the, the biggest key is just to express yourself and go in and think about the questions in advance and think about what comes after that so you can be efficient with their time when you have them for the 15, 20, 30 minutes you have them there. I'm going to continue uh, with menstrual cycles for just another question if I can. Because I had a very specific question, and if there's no answer to this, then that's fine. But I did want to try to at least answer this woman's question. She has been having trouble finding scientific research on how much the average women's insulin needs increase during PMS. Now, knowing that no one here is an endocrinologist, I'm not expecting you to answer this with any kind of numbers. But I thought this was interesting. She says she's seen research on healthy women that carb sensitivity decreases during PMS, but two endos and many of the online forums only suggest increasing basal, not changing your insulin to carb ratio. So my anecdotal question is, does any of that work for you? You mentioned changing basal rates. Do you ever look at your insulin to carb ratios? Does your body's reaction to food change during that time? Yes, and I've noticed that with Ashley too. Because the doctors recommend a change the basal rate, increase it, and that should do the job. But with her, it is just not working. So I definitely increase the amount of insulin she takes uh, for her boluses on top of increasing her basal rates. And we're trying to find the right balance now. And I think as the months go by, we're getting closer and closer to that balance. It's really a a trial and error, so to speak. But absolutely. Now, I've heard other women and, and don't have that problem, but I know growing... I wasn't a child when I had diabetes, but in my 20s and 30s, I had the same type of issues. And um, she's definitely going to have those issues during the, her life. Anybody want to add anything on insulin to carb? It's okay if not. No. Yeah, okay. I, I don't have that now. I, now, when you get to menopause. Oh, that's my next question. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, okay, let me set you up. go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I got a bunch of questions on this because, and I think this goes to, frankly, the, the age of our community because look how great it is that people are living so long with diabetes. And I mean, I'm not even 50 and I'm hitting menopause. I mean, don't have to be like old, but you know, cause I'm so young and, and vibrant. But, um, the question was <laughs> diabetes and menopause. I'm not there yet, but I want to know what to expect. And then like six people said, yes, agreed. There's no information on this topic. What's going to happen? What do I need to know? Does the hormone roller coaster ever change? And can I expect relief during menopause? <laughs> so here you go. Well, that's funny. Um, <laughs> It was so a very I'm popular 45, question. and I am going through menopause now. It has started here recently. What I heard from some healthcare professionals, but it's not in the literature because it's true, there is nothing in the literature. It's that women with type 1 diabetes tend to start menopause a little earlier. I've heard that, okay? So, so that's hearsay. If you expect relief, you're not going to get it. <laughs> I've heard that too. Um, about five years ago, about when I turned 40, my healthcare team, my diabetes team told me that I was becoming resistant to carbohydrates. So I have worked so hard and I'm still not there, but in limiting carbohydrates because my body's tired, I guess. I don't know what it is. I think that's turning 40. I think I mean, it I don't is. I have diabetes. I hate that. Darn it. Now you guys, I've told you how old I am and all of this piece of information that stinks. But your blood sugars, the other thing that I've been told, and again, it's hearsay. It's girlfriends with type 1 talking to each other, which is kind of cool about this, is that your blood sugars are going back to puberty again. It's that hard. And I would concur. But our technology today makes it a whole lot easier. And so my solutions, and then I'll stop talking, um, is I'm using adjunctive therapy. So I used insulin, but I also... Now I'm using Trulicity. I used to use Victoza. I've tried Metformin. So all of these type 2 drugs have a benefit for type 1s 
sometimes. And what I found um, as my body's changing and getting older is that they have benefit for a two-year period, and then you have to switch and do a new one because you get used to it and you need to keep changing things up. I was just going to say that that's a really good point that I went to my endo a few years ago and I asked if there was anything else because I felt like I was very active. I had a personal trainer at the time. I was working out all the time and I couldn't lose any weight. And I was, I'm also celiac. So carbs are, there's very limited carbs in my diet naturally. And I was doing everything I could and it just wasn't, I wasn't seeing any change. And so he put me on a type two drug supplement as well to go with insulin and my daily lifestyle and it made a huge difference. And for the first time in my whole life with type one diabetes, I finally felt like I was seeing changes I wanted to see. And that conversation came from doing some research, but then asking the doctor, what's out there? What's, can we think outside the box and, and what can you offer me? And, and he came up with that idea and it was great. I had the same experience. Um, I went on a, an injectable that helped level out my blood sugars. And it was one of the nice side effects of it was weight loss. Actually, I brought it home and my husband's like, can I go on this? (laughs) And I'm like, no, it's all mine. But that really helped. But as we're getting older, and I think I'm the oldest here, um, you know, I've noticed the same thing, carb resistance. Things are getting more difficult. I felt like in my 20s and 30s, things were pretty steady. And I hit my 40s, and now I'm approaching 50, and I'm struggling more. I'm getting more of those ups and downs, you know, instead of the straight line. And it's just becoming more and more challenging to keep control. And I don't know if that's because I'm premenopausal or what, or it's just a sign of age. Um, I did speak to my endocrinologist about it, and she did give me the wonderful news that the older you get, the more difficult it does get. Uh, I think similar to the point about going through puberty. It's similar to going through puberty again. So that's the the good news. Um, But like you said, the technology out today just helps so much. Having different basal rates on your pump, having the CGM and the predictive lows, and eventually, you know, the other end is coming with the predictive highs, I think is all going to help. And hopefully that's coming out in the near future. I have a dumb question follow up because that's what I do. But Nicole, you mentioned menopause and it it doesn't slow down the roller coasters and it's like puberty. Many women have that perimenopause period and then full menopause and then you're, you're really done. You come out, kind of come out the other side. It's probably not how they would phrase it. But at that age then, when really you are in menopause and it's over, I mean, women are living, you know, 30 years past it. Is it roller coastery the whole time? Do you know? I know there's not a lot of literature out there, but I would assume it's like puberty during. Yeah. And then after that, you're right. You're right. Thank you for clarifying that. That, That's what I've heard. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not on the other side yet, (laughs) Stacey. I'm in this too, but. Um, Yeah. I've heard that it's really a nightmare as you're going through it. Glad I asked again. (laughs) Yeah. And then when you come out on the other side, oh, look at that. (laughs) You don't have to fan anymore. Um, And you know, because it's a little confusing. Are you low? Are you hot? What's, I mean, I wake up now at night a lot. (laughs) Just. I'm really hot and sweating and I think I'm low and I'm not low. Um, so those are some of the pieces that get a little confusing for women when we go through the special time. Hey, some exciting news is that I know a couple of organizations are really thinking about this topic and are beginning to um, put together some survey instruments to gather some data so that we can have something to at least, you know, my grand plan is to have something to take to the NIH Office of Women's Health and say, look, we need to fund some research uh, on this topic. So if that grand plan happens was another topic of discussion altogether. But, you know, we first have got to gather all of this anecdotal information and pull it together in a systematic way. Oh, that's great. All right, so this is more holistic health, let's call it, or just big picture stuff. I don't know a lot of women with a lot of free time, and you three seem like you're exceptionally busy. Let's just talk for a moment. When we talk about self-care for people without type 1 diabetes, right, that's really important. I know that I'm supposed to stop taking care of my family first and take care of me and blah, 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 blah. I hear that all the time. And we try to do it, but we're not that great at it. But you really have to do that. But the question is, how do you do that? Because I know that the three of you work long hours at home or at work. You're, you're very busy. You're taking care of things. You're traveling. 
I guess I'd just ask you to step back for a minute and see if you have any advice for, I don't think anybody has it all or balances it perfectly. I don't want to put you on the spot that way. But any advice? I mean, Risa, you've got kids of all different ages. <laughs> I mean, how do you, and I assume you manage diabetes pretty well because you're doing great. It, it's difficult and it's a struggle. And one of the first things I learned was don't be so hard on yourself. Diabetes is hard. And you don't have to be perfect. You can, as you all know, you can do the same exact thing one day and get great blood sugars and the next day be all over the place. And it took me a long time to accept the fact that I don't have to be perfect. And you probably heard the speaker this morning talking about how, you know, a number shouldn't define you. And I think it, that is so important to keep in mind. You are not a bad person because your blood sugars aren't in control or your child's blood sugars aren't in control. You're doing the best that you can. Um, and also, I think it's important to try to find an outlet. I have found exercising is my outlet, which is kind of a double-edged sword because it makes it more difficult to control my diabetes. But the benefit that I get from it just outweighs those struggles. It gives me that stress release. And I think that everyone needs to find something like that for yourselves. So this is year 20 for me with type 1, and I think if I take a step back and think about all of it so far, it's to look at the big picture. Don't get stuck, like Chris said this morning, in the moment. You know, a blood sugar is going to be low and it's going to be high at different points, and you probably have nothing to do with it. That's just your body. And so to take a step back and look at the big picture at all times is really important so you don't beat yourself down. And then you can try really hard when you do have the time and you have the energy and you have the focus to look at your diabetes. But every once in a while, you get distracted and that's fine. But as long as you're keeping it as a top priority, the majority of the time, you can breathe a little and know that you're doing your best. And that's all we can do is just do our best every day. I'm going to complicate it before I get to you. And then I'm going to follow back with you guys. Do you ever ask for help? <laughs> Uh, no. And it's not a character flaw. I just yeah. wanted to set up how hard it is to ask for help. It is very difficult to ask for help because then you get follow-up questions <laughs> that are frustrating, right? And for me, it's the why and the what and, and the things that actually turn the helpers into the diabetes police because they're trying to get you to a solution and to help manage through it. But the perception um, is one of judgment. And so that's really difficult to deal with. So that, it, it makes it hard. I've got one or two people in my world that I can trust to ask for help. And I don't think actually we ever really wind up with that many core people. And so it's identifying who they are and then setting some boundaries around the kinds of conversation when we're asking for the help. I'm not low. It's just, it's not connecting to my phone. Um, just so you know, I didn't need to ask for help. <laughs> On the balancing, I am a type A personality. I am uh, have a hard time with stress uh, because I self-stress. I'm always engaged in something and I'm always planning the next thing. And so my solution for myself is that I always have a vacation or a getaway that's planned. And now, see, that's part of like my planning gene. But if I always have that, I can always see it on the horizon and I can look at it or look to it when I need to decompress and chart, okay, how long is it going to be until I get there? So that's just something unusual that I do with my family. Um, and it's little things or big things, you know, it, uh, next weekend we're going to Graceland. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's our target, right? We're, we're all working toward Friday when we're meeting at Graceland. The other thing that I do three times a day at varying times, but usually it's in the morning, the middle of the day and the evening is I walk and I don't often listen to music. I often just walk and listen to birds and sounds and I, look around and I consciously start counting the things that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for that green grass. That bird is beautiful. Uh, this music of nature. I'm grateful that I have the few minutes to walk around. And then I start, when I get through gratitude, I start planning. 
<laughs> because it clears my mind and it lets me think of, okay, here's what I need to do next and here's how I can be effective at it. And so it's really a moment away for me. And I have to do it three, I, three times so that I can get that clarity of process to move forward. I think being a planner just comes naturally for people with type one because there's so much that we have to control and sort of try to put into place. And that is actually one of the therapies I use is, okay, I'm going to figure out what the problem is. What do I need to do to fix it? What are the options? And, and that helps me not get so overwhelmed and stressed about things. And there's a lot of times where I'll just pull out a sheet of paper and start writing lists down. Okay. What do I need to get out of my head so I can, so I can get out of my head? Um, one other piece that I have come to find is that makes it all come together is to really put together that support network, whether it's one other person or 10 other people and I know that locally through Dancing for Diabetes and Touch by Type 1, we've created a little small network of people that get together on put, putting this together. And a lot of times our meetings start focused on the event and then it leads to talking to each other. Oh, did you, what do you do with this? What do you do with that? And so we have these friendships that have come out of it and we can call and text whenever we need to. And I'm lucky enough that I have a really amazing spouse that has never once questioned any diabetes thought I've ever had and just simply says, what do you need? Do you need a Gatorade? Do you need this? Do you need me to get you that? This morning here in the hotel room, I woke up and instead of asking for anything, I called to the front desk to see how quickly they could bring an orange juice up. My husband got out of the bed and said, I'm going to go to the vending machine right now. Don't worry. And, and so we should ask for help, but it's nice that there are people in my life that just know that they can handle it too. And so Think about who's close to you or who can be close to you uh, with a little bit of work and, and rely on them because we're, you all, everyone needs at least someone they can count on for sure. You know what she just gave you, by the way? Moms who have younger daughters, maybe who aren't married, it's like the, t- the primer or the, the test for the future guys that come into <laughs> your life, right? Like diabetes is the ultimate resource to use to discard the bad apples. <laughs> the boyfriend <laughs> test. Will you get me orange juice? <laughs> yeah. We're supposed to end, but we started just a little bit late. Can I ask one more question? Okay. One of the things that I think I hear a lot about younger girls with type one from their parents is how do I help her with body image? It's not just that there are food issues and insulin issues. It's the technology and it's wearing of gear and and bruises on your body, perhaps. And I know we're not going to solve that in the next 10 minutes here. But I was just wondering if you could address that a little bit, because we as women have issues, I mean, men too these days, so we all have body image issues anyway. If anybody wants to jump in, you want to start, Risa? Well, yes, and I can say when I was diagnosed in my early 20s, I had issues with wearing a pump and with people, people seeing that I was wearing this medical device. And that carried with me for quite a long time. Um, insulin pumps weren't that common back then, and you'd get a lot of strange looks about them. And then I had a daughter, and she was diagnosed. And I made the decision that I don't want her to feel that way. I want her to be proud of who she is. And she, if she is a person that needs has diabetes and needs to be on an insulin pump or a continuous glucose monitor, then she should be proud and wear it outright. So whereas like we used to go on cruises and take the pictures and I would make sure my pump was hidden and not seen in the pictures, now I wear it just like my my CGM right here, right out there, because I want her to see that. And I want her to see it's not nothing to be embarrassed about. In fact, you should be proud because how much more difficult is getting through life when you have type 1 diabetes? And if you can be successful. And when I say be successful, I don't mean have perfect blood sugars, but I mean just have a good quality life, then you know you have succeeded more than anyone else without it, without that type of challenge. And I think that has helped her a lot in terms of, of body image, you know, because you're right, there's so many pressures out there on girls to look perfect and be perfect and meet this image. And if we could get them to just be so proud of who they are and what they're accomplishing and how they're surviving, I think that will go so far as they get older and turn into, you know, young women. I was terrified to put my Dexcom on my arm when I first started using it. Part of that is 
living in Florida, it's hot. Okay, so now when I wear a tank top, someone's going to see it and ask me questions and they're going to look at me funny. And those are the things going on in my head, right? But being around some of the kids, they would wear it everywhere. So I'm like, if they can do it, I can do it. And what led me to start doing that was I was putting everything on my stomach. I'm going to pump, my Dexcom. Well, it, at some point, it, you've got to give your body a little bit of a break. And so I said, all right, well, I guess I'll try it this one time. And I put it on my arm and nothing happened. No one asked me anything. No one said it was weird. No one looked at me funny. So I like, okay, I'll keep doing this. And what I found over some time is people were actually coming up to me and asking me questions and saying, oh, what is that? Is, is that a diabetes thing? And so we would have a good conversation out of it. And then when I was now confident about it, I would then think, okay, this is now a tool. Now I'm going to wear it proudly when I go shopping or I'm at the grocery store. And I hope people come up to me. I'm ready to tell them about it. And so it, it's definitely been a process, but I was terrified when I first got the Dexcom. It actually sat on my counter for months before I even took it out of the box and put it on because I was just too nervous about it. I think this is a very significant issue. And if left unchecked, it can spiral into many other negative issues. So I've learned recently from uh, the psychology researcher Brene Brown. You've heard of her, right? She's all over pop culture right now. She has this technique which has really been effective for me and in raising my daughter. And it says, start your conversations with the story I'm telling myself is to identify if it's real or not real, right? We did this as a family last night. It was my mother, my daughter, and I shopping. And of course, we all found things that we thought we looked bad in, right? And the story I'm telling myself is this makes me look too heavy. <laughs> you know? And then they chime in and say, no, are you crazy? That's not the real story. And But then another one did it, right? Oh, I don't like this. I need to lose 20 pounds. And we go, no, no, no that's not the real story. So it's teamwork and having the support, but then also recognizing when you are on the verge of that temptation of the negative self-talk, because that's really super powerful. Body image is always going to be there as a challenge, especially for women, because our devices are ever-present. Uh, and I was diagnosed before we had these devices. So it's only becoming a little bit more and more. The more we can do to show our young people uh, examples, role models like Elizabeth, others, that look at them. They're doing it. It's okay. Look at this creative technique that they figured out. The better. In fact, uh, my friend from Tandem carries around a picture of, uh, it's of me from January wearing my pomp. And I'll tell you truthfully, the dress was just a little tighter than I expected it to be. So I could not put the pump where I wanted it. So I clipped it to my boots. And he took a picture and he goes, yeah. And I went, well, I'll do that again. <laughs> so just like getting creative as a community is going to help a lot. And I would just add to that, if your daughters are saying, I don't know anybody who wears this, I don't see anybody who looks beautiful, if, if you allow them to go on Instagram or show them your account, there are so many wonderful young people, I say as an old lady, but who are wearing their devices and making them front and center. So I would highly recommend, you know, so, yeah, that's yeah. a good. And there's a couple of companies that have just come out featuring people with health conditions oh, and yeah. showing the airy, the right, airy that makes Thank the bras you. and yes. she has the, she's supposed to come on my podcast. We keep missing each other. And even I'll point you out, glitter and glucose yes. is in the room, glitter and glucose on Instagram, always looking gorgeous with her diabetes accoutrement, but you wear it proudly. So I'm glad we had the time to answer that because, you know, and you're hearing from a Miss America. Oh, I always, you know, we think you're, we think you're perfect. And it's so wonderful to know that you are not. I mean, it, you laugh, but doesn't that help? It helps me. Oh, I don't look like I looked when I was 20. I would love to. You know, we all have body images. You don't have to even have type one. But when you, so thank you all for being so helpful. Thank you all for being such a great audience. This was helpful to me as a mom of a child who doesn't have diabetes. My daughter doesn't. So I hope it helped you. Thank you all so much. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Thanks again to everyone for participating in the panel and to Touched by Type 1 and Elizabeth Forrest for letting me tape it and play it back for you here. 
Uh, thrilled to do that. What do you think? Do you want to hear from more conferences in the future? Should I record more of these panels and more of these talks? It, it can be a little dicey. Not everybody wants their talk recorded, but I can certainly see what I can do as I'm traveling to more and more conferences this year and next. So let me know what you think. And if you don't already know, these extra episodes are being transcribed. Once a month, I am sending them to people who are subscribed to the newsletter. If you're not already subscribed, when you sign up, you'll get that month's episode, the transcription, sent right to you. And then every week after that, you get the podcast episode sent, uh, bonus material, all good stuff. No spam, no nonsense coming to your inbox. The easiest way to sign up for the newsletter is just go to diabetes-connections.com and a little note will pop up. If you hang out for a couple of seconds, it'll say, you know, learn more, sign up here, that sort of thing. So please do. It's a very easy way to keep in touch, especially if you're not on Facebook. Uh, I would really encourage you to just join the newsletter to stay in touch. All right. Thank you so much to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. I'm Stacey Sims. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.